Joshua, thank you for joining me today. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure, Yara, yeah. So uh, as we were talking about off air, we have, well, I have a lot of things I'm interested in you because uh, your history as working in Australia, you're obviously here because you are doing some things in crypto, which is huge and very popular right now. And, and um, I haven't had a lot of guests talk crypto, so I love to sort of open up some of the uh, mysteries around that topic. Um, right. I mean, I know you were around early Bitcoin, Mount Gox, obviously. It's funny because I played Magic the Gathering when I was a teenager, oh, yeah. <laughs> and Mount Gox obviously started as a Magic the Gathering website before it became a crypto exchange. So there's so much I want yeah. to talk about, but um, before we dive into history, I'd really just like a, a good summary. So Voltoro mm -hmm. is the longer running company you run now, and then the standard, yeah. I feel like, is a spin-off kind of project, new business. Do you want to just introduce those two for us? Yeah, sure. Um, so Voltoro was the very first, uh, after Mt. Gox collapsed, um, I really wanted to focus on building an exchange where the exchange was ultimately transparent, um, like radically transparent, because at the time, uh, Mt. Gox, for all those listeners that don't know, was one of the first, well, was the first exchange for Bitcoin. And um, at the time, there was a whole lot of Bitcoin things that were just crashing and going, disappearing, getting hacked. Um, and, and I, I thought this is, this is just insane. Uh, not, I wasn't, you know, it wasn't just me that lost a lot of money. It was like, we're in a movement, we're in a movement to change money fundamentally. And these greedy bastards are, are ruining it for the whole movement. And, um, and so, yeah, that was the whole idea was to not only have an ultimately transparent exchange, which I, I invented this thing called the glass books protocol, which we can talk about later, but also implement that we start trading against other rare assets like gold and silver rather than trading with fiat, which is the whole reason we're getting away from uh, uh, or getting into Bitcoin was to to get away from fiat. And so uh, it was sort of a shame to see everyone just trading against USD or or yen um, uh, instead of actually trading against other rare, rare, you know, rare numbers versus rare metals. It's a great combo. So that's that's where that came from. And then the standard is a protocol, uh, a DeFi protocol, which is uh, sort of an infrastructure protocol, because uh, we really there, there's there's a lot of gold, like 10 trillion and five of that is in personal hands, just sitting in vaulting facilities around the world, gathering dusk and and storing value. And that that uh, so we wanted to give that more of more value by allowing people to use that to collateralize smart contracts and issue themselves a fiat pegged stablecoin backed by gold and crypto, kind of like Maker, if anyone knows that, but uh, the next generation of that, basically. Okay. Yeah, yeah definitely want to dive into both of those two, but I'd love to maybe cover them when we hit them in your story. So um, yeah. we were kind of discussing off air before we hit record your last name, Shigala, and the spelling yeah. and... Uh, you said it might be Polish. I said it sounded Italian. We don't really know. Were you actually born and raised in Europe or what's the family history? I was born in Berlin. Um, and the thing is, I was born stateless to uh, oh. my father, who was also stateless. And so he, because he was born stateless, because he didn't know his father, um, he could then travel back and forth across the Berlin Wall. And so he had this special sort of passport where hey, you're allowed in the East, you live in the East, your mother lives in the East, but you're also allowed to go because you're actually not East Berliner or Berliner at all. So, wow. you know, uh, being born stateless, I guess I'm a natural born anarchist. I don't know. Yeah. You're, you're decentralized <laughs> so, at birth. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but then, you know, mother, uh, she's Irish, so she got me a, a British passport and, um, and then I've been, you know, I've got different passports and stuff now, and, and uh, so that's all good. But yeah, it, it, it's a weird, it's a weird thing when you think about not belonging to any state. Uh, when you start to think about what the the, the role of a state is in protecting the, its citizenry and uh, its borders or its its uh, you know its systems, yeah, uh, that's it's always a fascinating thing. And I maybe that had a part to play with my fascination in in, in Bitcoin. Yeah, no doubt. I mean. How could you not sort of see the dots, connecting the dots there between 
stateless versus like you know fiat currencies i was attached to a state so um, yeah. yeah interesting and, and is your dad like did he eventually get a passport or what happened to him yeah funny funnily like he's full berliner and he would have to go to the auslander behörde which is like the the uh, you know immigration uh, place uh, where you'd have to like and he would stand in line helping helping all these people that didn't know german to fill out their forms because he was a full german but didn't have the but he had to be there to like you know renew his things oh wow but yeah he, he finally got uh, berlin citizen uh, german citizenship okay, okay. and uh, yeah so from there. you grew up then in germany was that where you went to school no in I, no i grew up in australia uh, hence okay. the wacky accent but um uh, basically, my mother uh, moved and immigrated uh, to Australia when when I was like five or six, um, and um, and from there I just sort of yeah we stayed there and grew up in South Australia down south and um, and uh, then yeah moved and lived in Sydney for a while worked worked there and uh, and uh, you know really um, got into special effects basically as. Uh, working in special effects and 3D animation when it was still SGIs, <laughs> these silicon, big silicon graphics machines. They're, for those that don't know, those, these boxes were like the size of fridges and, um, and uh, like Toy Story was made on that, the original Toy Story. And uh, when I first got to Sydney, I, I got asked to uh, work on a, a project um, called The Matrix. And I was like, uh, yeah, I'll do a little bit on that. I didn't even know what it was. I just thought, oh, yeah, I'll do this, like helping a friend out doing the sine waves on the Sentinels. Oh. And, uh, and then after, and I didn't ask for more work on it because I just thought, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for actually doing advertising. I don't want to do film, I want to do more advertising. And, and um, because the fast turnaround, then you're doing something new every, every month and it's more fun than film. You're like working for a year on something. And uh, anyway, like, a year or something later, I go to the cinema and watch this film and I'm like, why didn't I do more on that? That's just <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. 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 I remember watching the matrix, the first one. And I was like, that bridge is really familiar with the rain. Oh, I know why. Cause it's right next to the station in, in Sydney. So yeah, it's, <laughs> um, it's fun when you're in, in the city where something was filmed, but wow, you really missed out on the chance of like, I mean, it's funny too, cause the matrix is so much about, you know, illusions of structures and, you know, a reality yeah. not being real. So all these, all these kind of indications uh, towards what you're working on now. Um, yeah. W with your, I don't know if it was a passion or like just an interest or you decide to go into digital design because, you know, you, uh, there was a way to make money. Was that your, like, are we talking graduating from university and then you went into that career? Is that, or is it before that? No, I, I, I left school earlier because uh, I'd had enough of it. It just was too slow and annoying for me. And I, I went into real life and I got into real life and went, man, this is shit. <laughs> Sorry, excuse my French. There. This is crap. I, I um, yeah, better go back to school. And I went to the sort of adult reentry after a year of being out. All of a sudden you're an adult and you're like, ah, oh, uh, OK. Um, and I came across this little 3D animation suite uh, in the school, which had, which was on, um, on these really, uh, what are they They're like, like Pentium, uh, uh, something or other. Anyway, um, they had this, uh, program called 3d studio. It was before max. It was just a, before 3d studio max. If anyone knows that it was, uh, it was like the predecessor on DOS and, um, and you could like create a sphere and instantly shade it with a light. And I thought, that's amazing. Like I just fell in love with the fact that you could take a sphere and just instantly render it and then, you know, uh, um, animate it with, with some keyframes and this and that and the other thing. And I just really fell down a deep rabbit hole with that. Absolutely loved it. Then uh, ended up um, making Australia's first animated short film um, on, on that with another guy. Um, and oh, was then called? it was called uh, under pressure. It was called under pressure, but you, you won't find it. It was just our little thing. And, um, I have been actually trying to find it and, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> I want to release it again. YouTube but, has everything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was this five minute thing, uh, but it took a whole year to make. And, um, 
and it uh, yeah it, uh, it it really sort of launched me into into that side of special effects thing and there there wasn't really any any school you could go to back then for this stuff I mean I know it, it, they had 3D studio at this adult reentry school but it wasn't really anything accredited it was just like hey we happen to have this software and um, and I, I just you know would stay there I dropped every other class and would stay in this little lab for for days on end yeah that's cool um, you, know, sound, you yeah. sound like me when i was 18 and i discovered html and i was trying to design websites myself and you just sit there trying to move a pixel you know one left or right yeah. and it's like waste <laughs> the time but it's so much fun when you're doing it <laughs> you know? yeah um, yeah right absolutely now i can tell your career based on i know your, your linkedin here you you Definitely, like you continued in, in animation and design for a long time, but you transitioned to, what, to television. Is that what happened? Because I see an awful lot of TV stations I recognize growing up in Australia myself yeah. too. Channel Nine, Channel Seven. So how did that happen? Yeah, I mean, I, I was in, in in post production for a long time, and uh, and then TV pulled me in to be head of their special effects departments, and so I was um, always, <clears throat> uh, yeah. So I worked in television then doing their promos and special effects in certain shows and things that they were needed to be done um and uh and yeah in the meantime though i always had multiple startups going in the background because I, you know uh who wants to be bored so i i had uh i had this uh this sleuth of startups from um that were that were happening in the background uh and you know when you're when you're young you can you can basically deal with four hour sleep so <laughs> weeks on end so um yeah the, these startups um really led me down a passion of alternative economies um especially swap style because i really wanted to create a a, a platform where people could swap things rather than buying and selling because i just felt like especially after 9 11 um happened i i really wanted to I really deep dove into, you know, not only into like the hardcore conspiracy stuff, but also that kind of led to understanding banking and money and fundamentals of money. And, and this is, um, you know, I think it's something that's definitely not, not taught in school of where does money come from? What is money? Is it, is it backed by gold? Where does gold get its value from? What, what is it? And, and this, these sort of fascinating questions. And then that led on to reading, you know, Mises and all of the Austrian econo economists and, and really understanding boom and bust cycles and, and all of this stuff. I just found it really um, extraordinary because it's stuff that you just don't get taught. It's um, sort of hidden. I, I, yeah. I'm kind of curious about the connection then because um, swap style, which you just mentioned, uh, is in the fashion space, right? Like it's clothing swap. And then I think before that, you actually also had some another startup, um, a fashion boutique. I'm not sure I'm seeing in history here. So you clearly had an interest in fashion as well as... Well, not really. I mean, my, my girlfriend at the time or wife, she was right into it. Okay. I, I was... Uh, and, and we started Swap Style before um, the fashion boutique. Oh. And, but the thing was that Swap Style was actually... Uh, when, when we... Uh, when we engineered it, it was to swap anything for anything. Uh -huh. And this is a really interesting thing for anyone that's building a startup is that when we did anything for anything, <clears throat> we had all the mechanics and all the categories and everything like that. No one took up the story. They're like, oh, who wants to swap? Uh, well, I don't get it. I mean, you got to think this, this is the start, like very early internet days. So people didn't quite get it. And as soon as we just went and dropped everything else and just made it women's clothes, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, every woman's magazine wanted to do articles about it. And, mm -hmm. and it was so fascinating. We had, uh, we had TV shows in Fox over in America and, and, uh, and, and you know, all the, all the women's mags just doing stories because it was all of a sudden their niche. And, and so sometimes, um, just like Amazon started in books only, mm -hmm. sometimes it's really good as an early startup to really focus in on one thing and then get those niche, uh, you know, publications to talk about you. And how did it go? Like, did, did, and just to clarify too, so SwapStyle was a place where, like a website, you go to swapstyle.com, you would list your own clothing for Swap yep. and then other people would list theirs and you would just 
communicate directly and say, will you swap this for that? And then yeah, send it in the mail. That exactly. was the basic idea. What was your monetization yeah. model with that? Good. <laughs> it was basically, uh, let's, uh, let's see what happens. Actually, <laughs> what happened is that I realized very quickly that swapping is a really terrible way of doing anything uh, in terms of a marketplace. Because I, let's say I really love your shirt, Yaro. Like, I, I, I'd be like, oh, um, you know, uh, let's, uh, let's swap. And you say, oh, you know, I don't like anything of yours. And the deal falls through mm -hmm. and be stuck uh, with that. And that was it. Even though there's an entire marketplace, the, the deal would fall through and nothing else would move. And, and so I already started looking then at, a, at some sort of like credit system or that wasn't based on money. I, I was trying to figure out how can we, and that's actually when I started stumbling across some of the work that the cypherpunks were doing online mm -hmm. uh, to figure out decentralized money. And I, it, you know, it came, the, the writings were very obvious that this is a problem that can't be solved. And uh, which was the double spend problem. You know, when I send you a JPEG, you don't know if I've sent you the JPEG and I've deleted it. Like it's just a, <laughs> digital things are, are abundant. And, mm -hmm. and so this problem was unsolvable. Uh, every bit of literature that I read said it was unsolvable, but these crazy guys kept on working at it. And I, I kept a, an ear to the train track, so to speak. Um, and that's, I guess, how I came across Satoshi's white paper so early on. Okay, interesting. So you're making me think of um, house swaps right now because I've been getting some ads on my, my social thrown at me about, you know, I swap my house and I go live in someone else's house. And yeah. for the same problem you just mentioned, like, well, what if I don't want to live in their house at the same time they do? Or, you know, I want this person's house and there's a third person involved. We might all want to swap. So, of course, naturally, they've created a, a credit system where you can basically give your house to someone else. You get credits in the system, and then you can spend those credits on other rentals. So I can imagine for clothing something similar. But if I was presented that idea today, I would say, well, of course, you would tokenize that. And it wouldn't be a credit. It would be a token you'd get because mm -hmm. um, you know, it would just be you know, the natural choice today. But going back in time with, with the sort of January 2001, like you said, all the way up at the, I don't know if you closed it down or you, or just, um, you know, sold it or whatever, 12 years later, um, did that whole business, was it your main income stream during that time and, and, or did you, what happened? No, I was, I was still doing 3d work, okay. uh, freelancing and, and doing some advertising and, uh, brand uh, channel branding and stuff like that. So I, I'd, I'd continue working a little bit, but, um, yeah, eventually sold it, um, to someone else who then just, uh, let it die okay. basically. So, okay. <laughs> unfortunately, Sad but, but common. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it is what it is. And, uh, it really opened the gates to understanding money because one of the things you know obvious the, the obvious idea is building a credit system into the centralized database but first of all uh, i knew that e-gold got taken down by the government because people uh, the government doesn't like you making fake money mm -hmm. like it doesn't mm -hmm. like people competing with their money um the, that's really what bitcoin broke is the fact that it, there's no one to go after. And this is why Satoshi left, because it was an extremely dangerous thing to do. You're taking on the central banking system of the world. You're taking on the petrodollar. You're taking on, like, you know, the US arguably went to major wars to protect their, their uh, you know, oil settlement in dollar uh, uh, monopoly around the world. Uh, and, and you could, you know, there, there, there's stories of like Gaddafi wanting to do gold settlements. Um, that are, uh, Saddam also wanted to do the similar things and, and uh, you know, where are they now? Mm -hmm. But uh, really, the, the, Satoshi really solved this. And now I feel like people could do a centralized credit system. I mean, you see that already with like stock photo sites and stuff, you buy credits and then you spend those, they're right. pegged to a dollar. But uh, I, I didn't want to create something with swap style, which was then emulating a central... Ha, ha, who am I to like print new credits? Then, then everyone has to trust me that I'm not just printing credits and buying myself stuff on my own platform right. or, you know, kind of like Tether might be doing. <laughs> but uh, but uh, th this is the thing is that I really wanted to build something else. And this is what led me down the path of finding these um, 
these crazy uh, anarcho type people that were trying to build something totally different and 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 it really resonated with me yeah yeah it's such an important point because there's so many examples of a platform or a community that have their own virtual currency or credit i mean you can take like you know massive multiple online player games where they have mm. an internal credit system and they can buy and swap their items and so on and that functions okay um you were making me think of um I can't remember specifically what it was, but I listened to a podcast about WeChat, and at some time mm. early on in WeChat's life, an internal credit system was built, and the Chinese government had to say, no, you can't do that because people are using this now more than our actual currency, mm. so they had to shut it down. But it is interesting yeah. that this is what led to your exposure to uh, cryptocurrency and, and the cipher movement. So connect the dots here. Um, you were in digital design yourself you're running swap style as a side project possibly with your then wife um you discover this world of crypto and blockchain but it's still super early like um i feel like 2012 correct me if i'm wrong was sort of the mount gox or even later than that right um 13 it collapsed yeah. and, uh, so, so yeah, how did you so like I, what happened like because you you were in mount gox too so how did you like finally get yourself involved in that land yeah, so I, I started uh, in late 2010, really deep diving Bitcoin. And, um, you know, the only thing you could really do was buy alpaca socks uh, from some guy in, uh, I think it was somewhere in Europe. Um, and, uh, and there was Mt. Gox. Um, Silk Road had just sort of started as well. It was like, wow, this is nuts. Um, amazing. You know, if suddenly uh, the deep web had a function. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, if you look at it from a philosophical rather than some sort of moral scope, um, it really was an interesting time, because not only are you disrupting uh, government's sort of ability to uh, control money and inflation, but you also had the ability for people to voluntarily trade things that governments might not like. Um, you know, whether you whether you like or dislike that, it's it's a really interesting um, lens to start looking at how society if you if you take that as first principles and, and project that out, what would happen and, and, you know, some of the one of the things that we really saw happen was the fact that um, drug marketplaces started becoming really safe, because all of a sudden, the consumer could give feedback negative feedback to drug dealers like when when was the last time you, you met some drug dealer down the back alley and started shouting at everyone walking past this guy's selling crap cut with whatever you know you would just get a bullet so um so this was the first time people and, and you know anyone that was able to use bitcoin at the time uh, you know it was very technical uh, it was a very very rudimentary system so you had to be very technical and nerdy so a lot of the people using Silk Road were, were like university students that had access to all this testing equipment. So they'd like buy a product on this on these dark webs and then test it at the universities and then write feedback like, well, there's this much agent of that and it became really pure and people could like, <laughs> but it was a fascinating sort of just to wow. watch this play out going, wow, suddenly the this trade is becoming a lot safer um, because people are getting better product, plus mm, you can, uh, you know, the, it, you have to sell good stuff, to, just like eBay, to be able to sell more expensive because you've got a good reputation. And anyone coming in new would have to, like, basically have no profit because they have a new account. So it, there, there was this really interesting dynamic that was playing out. And of course, with that comes really negative, constant news um and headlines and and um and arguments against this sort of weird thing that's just for drug dealers or it's just a tulip bubble or it's just a there was you know all these typical arguments that you got back there but it was an absolutely fascinating time to seeing this this uh new wacky technology full of full of people that were, were ideologues um and you know nowadays there's a lot of you know, everyone, everyone and their dog has, has got a little bit of an investment in this. But 
um, back then it was really uh, people that were fascinated in either the technology and cryptography, um, either in ideology of like, uh, you know, um, anarchic ideology or even libertarian, uh, you know, if it wasn't anarchic, it was libertarian. Um, and, and so you would have these extraordinary conversations online about philosophy and, mm -hmm. you know, what other community d does that happen in really? Um, and so really, really, um, interesting stuff sort of played out. Sorry, I, I went a little bit no away problem. from you. Well, the only thing I don't know then, here is what was your role in like, were you participating at this point or just, just sort of con you know, having conversations? What was your, your, your job? I, I was, yeah, like, I mean, I, I, ha I had an account, uh, of course, um, in, in, uh, Bitcoin talk and stuff and we, you know, um, Satoshi was still around, but I, I, um, I really you know, I didn't really, I, I just sort of was doing my own thing. I was head of, uh, you know, the, the 3D at Channel, Channel 9 at the time. And, and um, I just had a lot on, but I was definitely uh, already working on it. So we implemented then Bitcoin into swap style uh, pretty quickly. Oh, wow. Uh, but the thing was, it was, no one knew what, <laughs> I'd get yeah. these emails like, what's this Bitcoin thing? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, ah, oh, and I'd have like a page explaining it. It was way too geeky because... You didn't have seed phrases, so backing up was really hard. You didn't have hardware wallets. You didn't. The original QT wallet was just like this, this, uh, which was the, the the reference wallet of Bitcoin. That was the only wallet you could have, and um, it was a uh, it was a complete nightmare. People kept on losing money, and you know mm -hmm. you needed to be full on tech head to okay. use it. But it was fun throwing it in there. So, okay, so and giggles. what? Like, I feel like there's a couple of years between this and you starting Vol Voltoro. So. Um, yeah. Is it a case of you're just living your life, you're working at Channel 9, someone had bought Swap Style, so that was no longer on your plate. Um, you're exploring the, that underground world, you know, on your nights and weekends. Um, yeah. And then I'm guessing, if correct me if I'm wrong, your source of, of crypto at the time being Mt. Gox, then it imploded, and that's what then triggered you to get into it? Is that kind of the, the chronology of your journey? Yeah, like, um, you know, I, I, I loved building little things and little weird applications like, um, I don't know, like price checkers or, you know, just stuff that's kind of rudimentary. And But um, it was, yeah, it was really after seeing multiple things collapse, like there was a service called instawallet.org, I think it was in .org. Anyway, it... Um, it allowed you to, like, as soon as you open that website, it would generate a wallet address and the URL would be your wallet. So you bookmark that and you didn't need a password, nothing. You just sort of instantly have one. And when you go back to your bookmark, there it is. If you lose your bookmark, it's gone. Um, and people were just using it. Of course, that was centralized service. Uh, all of a sudden, they got hacked. I say that because they probably just ran off with all the funds. And, you know, back then, uh, people were throwing around uh, hundreds of thousands of these oh. these tokens because they're really sort of just funny playthings. And mm -hmm. They were so cheap, uh, right? And, like, and, that, that's the point, too. Like, it would be billions of dollars now, but back then it was hundreds or thousands of dollars. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, um, and so I, I just, it was really that I had enough of all these people running away with people's money, and I wanted to build something that was truly transparent and... Um, so yeah, I, I, I'd actually moved to Germ back to Germany at this stage, um, to, to spend some time with my father because, uh, you know, I'd never really spent much time with him and, and he was here. And so I wanted to, you know, get to, get to know him better. And you speak German and, um, I assume? yeah, yeah, I speak German. I mean, I didn't at the time and now I speak very well cause I've been here for like nine years, 10 years almost. Okay. Um, so it's, um, but really what I wanted to do was build something that was ultimately transparent and also removed the banks from the equation and had a bank independent exchange that could trade between Bitcoin and physical bullion that was, uh, you know, held in high security vaulting facilities, top tier facilities that um, were fully insured and fully audited. And this was something that banks can't do. Banks can't get fully insured uh, or even fully audited because these, these institutions run on fractional reserve. You, you really don't know how liquid they are. And this is the beautiful, beautiful thing about gold. It's just a bar of metal sitting in a vault, like fully 
you know, really, really primitive money, you know. <laughs> And, uh, and, and the great thing is, an auditor comes in and counts it, looks at the serial numbers, um, it, there's, there's, a, there's a chain of custody, so you know that it went from the mine to the smelter, to, and it's never seen the sun, straight into the vault. And um, these, are, these are LBMA good delivery bars, they're called, and that, that it just sort of means that you can absolutely be assured that it's 99.99%, and, um, and that it would, uh, yeah, that, that you could easily, it's very liquid, you know, the gold market's the second most liquid market in the world under the effects market. So it's if if it's like never seen the sun, mm -hmm. because then it's you don't need to check it again. It just sort of flips and floats around. Right. So so this was a this was the idea behind Voltoro uh, after the Mt. Gox hack was really to allow people to, um, hey, uh, I just got paid in Bitcoin. I'll hedge it in gold because uh, I you know I I run a TV shop. Let's say I sold a TV for Bitcoin. Um, and I'll hold it in gold, and then when I need to restock, I'll sell the gold back to Bitcoin. And uh, if you know, hopefully my, my my supplier takes Bitcoin as well. But it was a way to really hedge out the volatility of Bitcoin in another rare asset. Um, so these you know rare numbers versus rare metals. It's uh, it was kind of a marriage made in heaven in my eyes. Funnily enough, Bitcoiners couldn't stand gold and gold people couldn't stand Bitcoin. And I never understood it. I was like, what are you guys fighting about? There's the enemy right there. It's yeah, called yeah. central banking. <laughs> I, just, I was actually thinking uh, so many times I've heard podcasts um, where, yeah, there's a gold believer and a Bitcoin believer and they both, you know, the store of value argument, that's what Bitcoin might be the yeah. best case use case for it. So it's replacing gold therefore, but you're right. It doesn't have to, it's just another store of value. And, you are the first person I've actually here, or at least create a company that's specifically about the the cross exchange between those two commodities. So that's interesting. But yeah. I would, by the way you described that initial idea for it, it was well and truly for already converted Bitcoin users, right? Like they were receiving yeah. the Bitcoin, then coming to Voltoro and saying, I want to yeah. basically back this up with, with gold. And then yeah. vice versa, you could take out Bitcoin, you know, and the gold goes back. So um, yeah. can you tell me, you're in Berlin, I'm assuming, you have this idea. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, what, certainly when you had the idea. Um, I wouldn't even know how to begin doing what you just thought of as an idea. Like, do you go find yeah. a gold supplier and then an engineer who can then make a exchange that works with this gold supply like what's what's the engineering yeah. of this process yeah i mean this is the thing right is that that that's why i love the the steve jobs uh quote of you know stay hungry stay foolish because you sort of foolishly think oh i've got an idea let's do it and <laughs> and then it's really the heart of hard things is building a startup around stuff but um you know basically I was lucky enough that my half brother over here is an absolutely brilliant engineer. Um, and uh, he single handedly coded the exchange. And, uh, and then also, um, you know, way down the track later on was, we were the very first exchange in the world to implement the lightning network, uh, for the same reason that I could say, Hey, Philip, you know, uh, can you, you know, chomp on this problem for a while? And he was like, oh, okay, and then here it is. So uh, uh, that, that was really handy. But also uh, being in, in Berlin and uh, it's, it's just a hop, uh, jump, skip and a hop away from Munich, uh, which has uh, got a lot of the gold industry in Germany. And then another hop, skip and jump away from Switzerland, uh, which is obviously um, highly, uh, highly, renowned for its gold industry and also London. So it's really that, that, that whole area between the London bullion markets, Switzerland, Munich, Berlin, it kind of just sort of fit. So we, um, we had a meeting with one of the largest gold suppliers in Europe called Pro Aurum, and, um, and they really loved the idea. We went in there first because we didn't want to give them the idea and say, well, we want to build an exchange between them. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. And then we're like, we're going to do it with Bitcoin because <laughs> you got to remember, folks, like back then, Bitcoin was only for drug dealers, yeah. just like the Internet, actually, for the you know the very first people on the Internet. It was only for pornographers yeah. and, and it had a really terrible Absolutely. name. Like, what are you into pornography? Why do you want the Internet? Like, yeah, 
uh no like what there's really good university like uh, like it's it's <laughs> people but but the narrative what everyone believed was that it's just for drug dealers and uh, and stuff and so so there was a lot to sort of get get around and and um but yeah so so we built um we took a year to basically build the exchange um and test it and the thing with bitcoin you can't move fast and break things you <laughs> <laughs> like you can in Silicon Valley, because mm -hmm. if you break things, you lose everyone's money. So mm -hmm. we had to, you can't really build an MVP. You have to really build a quite a, a hefty infrastructure around it. And, um, and so it did take a while back then. Plus we were really, um, we were really inventing stuff as well. Um, so it wasn't, you couldn't just take a library, um, you know, JavaScript library and plug it in and hey, presto, you have a wallet. Uh, you really, you'd have to build your own wallet and own uh, backup solutions, uh, own multi-sig solutions for, for security. Um, it really, uh, you know, we really deep dove. And, you know, we've been around since 2015 and we've never had a hack or any, anything like that. So, you know, touch wood, we've, um, we've been security obsessed since the, since the beginning and, um, and uh, successful because of that. Okay, so forgive me if I get too super basic here, but this will help me and, and the listeners no doubt understand too. And I'm going to ask this for when you first rolled out the first version of the business, yeah. but I feel like it might not be that dissimilar from what happens today. I have yeah. a Bitcoin in my own wallet right now. Yeah. I yeah. want to use Voltoro's service. So do I transfer my Bitcoin from my wallet to a wallet on Voltoro? And then how is that? hedged against the actual gold? Like does Voltoro talk to a Swiss vault and say, this gold has now been, you know, bought this Bitcoin? Like how does the, that yeah. interaction happen? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So <clears throat> basically a user, we're a custodian of the Bitcoin. So um, people do, they generate a wallet address uh, with us and then people send their crypto on there and then a little number goes boom, boom, boom to reflect that state change. Um, so now, now your Bitcoin uh, are stored by us. Now, um, for the very, very hardcore, this I definitely think, and I, I keep always say it: don't use exchanges as wallets. Everyone does, uh, especially if you're new in this game. But you shouldn't. Um, uh, you know, we've we've never we've never been hacked or had anything happen. But it's just better that the whole ethos of Bitcoin is to be your own bank, and to take that few days to really learn about security of, of private keys. How do you secure digital assets? But yeah, so people, people have that database entry. And then what we do is we buy uh, good delivery bars uh, in big, you know, either kilo bars or half a kilo bars. And, and then we sell those off um, to multiple people. So, but it's allocated. So uh, what allocated means is that if we go broke as an exchange, we're not doing our business properly, it doesn't matter. Uh, liquidators can't touch our clients' assets because it's not on our books. Mm -hmm. um, and this is really important because if a bank goes broke, uh, many people don't know this, but banks actually own your money. When you put money into a bank, it's not your money anymore. It's legally their money and they pay you some interest for that privilege. Um, and they can go speculate and do all sorts of stuff with it. And that's why you can have bail-ins and stuff where they just don't pay you back. You know, <laughs> it's right. happened in Cyprus, right? right. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so th that was the point was to build this, um, this legal, legal framework around allocated bullion. And, um, and then, so what happens is we have this gold and when, once that gold is sold off to a bunch of people, over time, we, we, of course, buy a new one just before the last bit is sold out. And depending on the volume, we'll, we'll have lots more happening and it's constantly going um, and being sold back. Or So we sell to the wider uh, bullion markets once people start selling off. Let's say Bitcoin's um, you know, right up the top and, uh, and people will start buying a lot of gold. And then Bitcoin crashes, people start selling their gold to buy back, buy the, buying the dip. Um, that's when we'll, uh, you know, we'll sell it, uh, we'll buy it back off the client and sell it onto the wider bullion markets. Okay. And so there's, there's a lot of cogs moving in the background, um, but we are still the cheapest way to buy and sell gold. Um, uh, of course, it's allocated. It's not gold. I mean, you can take it home to cuddle if you want, um, but 
it, 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 we weren't built for that. We were built for a, a large scale in and out, easy movement. Plus if uh, mm -hmm. the stuff hits the fan, you can go and get it and collect it and, or get it sent out to you. We do have that option because it is your gold. You can do whatever you want with it. But it's, that's where it gets expensive because there's all sorts of insurance. As soon as silver leaves the vault, it attracts taxes and VAT and all this stuff. So, okay. um, so it's uh, yeah, it's it's designed for it quick in and out and um, and and yeah, that that's that's kind of it. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, just to clarify a couple of things, if not that it's going to happen, but if you guys went completely out of business, disappeared, my yeah. Uh, any Bitcoin I've transferred to to your custodianship, I'd actually just have the gold in wherever the vault. Well, no. So when you when you put Bitcoin on the site, you then have to buy gold with that. So you need to place a buy order. So we have two mechanisms. Okay. One is a full order book exchange where you you have an order book. Uh, this is basically a line of people that want to buy and a line of people that want to sell. Got it. And the so people that want to buy. Exchange. Okay. Yeah, standard exchange. It gets more expensive as, as people want right. to move down the line. It gets cheaper on that way. And, and where it meets, they have the spread. Yep. And we've just recently launched um, like an easy buy and sell where we're the counter uh, counterparty every time um, because a lot of people just wanted to quickly buy gold and then sell it again. And um, so, um, but we, we are implementing right now. We had it for a long time. Um, but we rebuilt this exchange from the ground up uh, a couple of years ago and we haven't uh, implemented this feature yet, which is like an auto trading bot almost where um, people would tick a few boxes and it would, as soon as the Bitcoin would arrive, we, our system would keep an eye on that address. And as soon as it arrived, it would go and buy gold. And, um, and then, you know, now we're, we're making that a little bit more advanced. And, and back then in the day, people wouldn't mind directly to Voltoro. And it, it would basically mine real gold with with digital, <laughs> with digital gold. gold. It was kind of interesting. <laughs> kind of yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah, what a connection. So you could almost have, I could set up my mining facility. I'm in Montreal. There's a lot of water energy. I could set it next to a hydro plant. It will generate Bitcoin into my wallet at Vault Toro, which is then in turn turning it into gold, or I could turn it into gold, so my water could be turned into gold, basically, which is... Yeah, really yeah, yeah, fun. absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, Okay, so that makes sense to me. So really, the main uh, feature here was it's an, it's the the exchange of I want to play with both a cryptocurrency and gold, knowing that I actually own the gold when I have the gold on your platform. Um, yeah. Where does though the one part I'm a little lost with, obviously with Mount Gox, it gets hacked. All the wallets addresses are taken by the hackers, so they get all of the crypto that was there so then then disappear mm. 469 yeah. million or whatever it was um yeah what how is your system obviously besides the better layers of protection we now have with exchanges but like you said you know yeah. coinbase is still an exchange it still has your crypto rather than you have it unless you pull it into your own wallet right so yeah. what yeah. what is where's the extra layer that is it only because if i turned it into gold it would be protected or is there anything else that i have no so on? Yeah, so one of the things that I really um, put my head and my mind on, initially when the Mt. Gox hack happened, um, I wanted to build a decentralized exchange. And they exist nowadays, but back then there was only Bitcoin. There wasn't Ethereum. There wasn't these um, you know, Turing complete smart contracts that could write complex, you could execute complex code on a, code on a blockchain. Um, but... Uh, it, it really Bitcoin didn't have the what's called op return codes. Basically, the programming language of Bitcoin uh, wasn't wasn't um, uh, yeah sophisticated enough to allow for decentralized exchanges. So, rather than that, uh, I sat down and really figured I want to focus on transparency because hey, what's the blockchain? It's this amazing transparent. Um, mechanism where you could follow the money and and see how much is somewhere so what we focused on is rather than a decentralized exchange uh, which we couldn't build at the time we focused on using um, uh, utilizing transparency so we took the blockchain as a um, as an inspiration so what we did uh, was create this thing called the glass books protocol and how it works is that um, we would give everyone an anonymous ID. So we would give you an anonymous ID. 
And, um, and so only you and us would know what that is because we issued it to you. And then you could log out so we don't know that you're checking. And, and we would publish every ID code and how much Bitcoin that ID has and how much gold that, that ID has. Um, so, uh, so anybody at any time could check their ID and check, oh yeah, it's, there's that much uh, should be on my account. And we can't fiddle with those numbers because if we do, the sum of everybody's holdings um, would be out, right? So th the first step is, okay, my thing is right. So I can assume everybody's is right. Otherwise, someone will be screaming and shouting on the internet somewhere because you know, we have a lot of clients and they can check at any time. And then we publish the, the, the cold wallet addresses. Um, so people can, uh, and we had at the time this concept of a warm wallet, uh, won't bore your customer, uh, your, your, your listeners with that. But um, basically, the cold wallet addresses, people could check the sum of everybody's holdings was, uh, was, was less than or equal to the amount of uh, crypto in the cold wallets. And, um, and so this, this all of a sudden allowed people to audit us in real time all the time. But not only that, we had the, um, the voting facility uh, uh, statements, we have the insurance paperwork and the auditors um, paperwork uh, in real time. So we could see how much gold bullion uh, everyone has, how much gold everyone's got and make sure that also equ uh, equals out. And so this was a real game changer in trust of centralized authorities. Of course, you still had to trust that we're doing what we're doing. But if, for instance, Mt. Gox had this, because the hack happened over a fairly long time with Mt. Gox, they lost a little bit of money, they sort of hid it from everyone, turned into a Ponzi scheme where they're trying to like get new clients in to pay for anyone that's withdrawing. And, yeah. and that then just spiraled out of control as they got into more and more legal problems and had to pay this and that and just ran their business terribly. Uh, but if there was this uh, Glassbox protocol in place, I think even the owner, Mark Carpellis at the time, would, would have been happy because someone would, he, even he didn't know that he'd gone into a Ponzi, mm. that he'd gone into a downward spiral because it was just all too complex. Mm. So having this sort of grandma-friendly transparency allows for uh, for the, the, the community to to give you a little... <laughs> Uh, tap something on the shoulder wrong. and say, hey, there's, there's something not right. There's like a kilo missing, you know, what, yeah. what's going on or whatever. So, um, uh, so yeah, that's, this is, um, this is how, this is how it's done. Okay, there, there is a, yeah, there, there's, um, a, as we've grown though, we've had, um, we have a lot of people constantly generating um, uh, warm wallets or hot wallets. And so there's, there's a little bit of technical issues there now uh, with having, ultimate transparency because we obviously we can't publish a billion different addresses mm -hmm. and have people check so um uh but yeah we're working on different solutions for that as well and okay. um yeah i mean the short answer is there's no such thing as a secure centralized exchange right that's the end of the day it's 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 impossible to until but it is decentralized so um interesting but even though. then even then because even decentralized exchanges you have to trust the code right so with centralized exchanges, you have to trust the code, you have to trust the banks that they're using, and you have to trust the business the owners. that's yeah, the, the exchange. So yeah. there's three, three trust things that you have to trust. With decentralized exchanges, you only have to trust the code. Um, because even if you're a coder, you still have to trust the code. Like a lot of, um, uh, a lot of uh, smart contract auditing firms, their business model is basically praying because <laughs> because they can read the code, they can look through it, but they some they, they don't know everything. Yeah. You know, this is what hackers do. They find the bit that you can't see yet. Right. They figure it out. And, mm. and so uh, th this is a tricky thing with complex smart contracts. And we're seeing it over and over again. I mean, we saw a few epic hacks <laughs> in the DeFi space because of this problem, right? Yeah. Well, I was unfortunately in um, Einstein Exchange in Vancouver, one of the, uh, oh. one of the, I lost a bit of money there. And that was like, I just had the money still on, on my, both in a wallet and just in their account with the USD. And I was like, wow, I, I didn't realize how vulnerable I actually was. It just the owner disappeared. And much like you said, yeah. with the Ponzi scheme, I think that's what was kind of going on behind the scenes. 
it was moving money mm -hmm. from one to the other based on whatever there was a call for money, but eventually obviously there's no more money to do that with and you're out, yeah. um, which forced me, as you kind of alluded to before, it, to really learn how to put my crypto in cold storage for the first time and go, okay, now I know. I feel, nice. Now I feel safe, except now I feel like I could lose the, you know, the key and the, and the, the yeah. but anyway, it's, it's safer than it could have been. I would like to maybe switch to the entrepreneur hat you're wearing as the founder of Voltoro. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe not that one, yeah. but you know, <laughs> you, you came up and I think it was your half brother for um, Voltoro and obviously cool idea. Um, even as a basic idea, you just allowed a person to have gold and Bitcoin and just trade them as they're going up and down and try and profit on the spread, right? So that's that's a yeah. simple idea in many ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you and your half brother figure it out. You get the either whether Switzerland or Germany, uh, yeah, the UK, the gold supply, the communication between your uh, centralized platform and, and the supply. And then you go and tell the world you exist, right? And you get your first Bitcoin deposit into your wallet and the first trade with gold. Um, how yeah. did it go? Like, how did you grow this startup? Oh, that was amazing. Like when we hit the go button, you know, we'd done an we, we, we pulled an all nighter to really, you know, because you have this deadline of like launching and like things aren't quite ready and this and that. And we hit go and, you know, refreshing the back end to see like accounts coming in and, yeah. and uh, people starting to chit chat on these forums uh, because, you know, really it was still early days, you know, 2015 and, um, and it was, it was just really exciting to see something that you've spent so long being built being talked about. But of course, the, the first thing that comes out is like, really, really strange, because they, they would all of a sudden say, ah, oh, it's some centralizing, why would I buy gold? Why would I? And, and some people really got it. Some people and this is the interesting thing about Voltoro is, of course, it doesn't have the millions of, of customers that like Coinbase has, or, or, you know, you know, CZ with with Binance, but it has this core customer base that really understands economics. And, and so what was fascinating is that these booms and busts that we see, there would be huge um, sort of signals in the Volto in Voltoro markets, showing that we're heading towards a peak, uh, mm -hmm. that a certain little bubble is going to pop because the people using us were very deeply uh, uh, in, in a deep understanding of economic theory, boom and bust cycles and all the rest of it. And um, whereas a lot of other exchanges, they were just full of sort of moon boys that were just, you know, throwing money at anything and, yeah. and uh, would sort of live off the, the troll box and, you know, chatting to each other. But so, so well, what's this an indicator was, though? This like, was you, like, sorry to interrupt, but what, what's, what do you mean by an indicator? Like buying more gold? Like purely just volume yeah like okay. as soon as we started seeing massive gold volumes it was the top and and sure enough after like a spike in our volume it would boom it would drop down and and then you could also see as gold was um being sold back off that we we're like heading towards the bottom um you mean because in the bitcoin the, price in the crypto price or do you mean in the, in yeah. the broader market in the broader, no, okay. like in the versus crypto, yeah, okay. Bitcoin versus gold. So okay. gold in in the price of so they uh, actually had a, a, a what we'd call a tradition like gold really was a hedge against crypto in that case. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And we had some amazing traders who who um, made a lot of money. Like in 2017, would just put everything into gold. It would drop down and they would buy it back, buy it back. Um, yeah. a year later. And it was extraordinary. And the other thing is, in, in a lot of countries, well, in Germany specifically, there's like, uh, if you held gold for more than a year or Bitcoin for more than a year, it's capital gains free. So there was all these like, um, you know, and there's different countries that do similar thing. So uh, people played it very, very smart uh, mm -hmm. with gold. And, and so our customers, they're very, they're very astute customer. And, um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely been an interesting ride of course, in that whole like starting a crypto business in 2015, even now, uh, is 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 extraordinarily hard because um, you know we have employees, we have marketing, we have all the rest of it, servers to pay, um, 
uh, and and gold suppliers to pay with with fiat you know so mm -hmm. it's um it, it's really really difficult dealing with the uh, with the legacy banking system who absolutely hates you um doesn't understand you thinks that uh, everything is money laundering and um and and uh, drug dealing and everything else when it it absolutely isn't like it's literally people that understand I don't trust the banks because they're in fractional reserve. I do trust a chunk of metal that's sitting in a high security voting facility in, in Switzerland. Um, so um, that, that's why I'm using it. And, um, and so it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's really a difficult, difficult thing to start a startup in the crypto space mm. um, because of this. And I think this is the reason why we're seeing such a boom in the DeFi space is that Hey, we're not going to deal at all with banks. We're just going to be crypto to crypto mm -hmm. only, and mm -hmm. and it's uh yeah the level of uh, the barrier of entry is a lot easier in terms of this sort of regulatory capture that the banks have done, um, and, and and the regulatory capture thing is a very fascinating part of the whole story because banks. Uh, banks have built so much regulation around themselves. And it's funny because he, a lot of people, especially on the left, are like, we need to regulate the banks more. And it's like, have you seen the regulations that are around banks? It's nuts. Like the amount of rules that they need and paperwork up to here, every like, it, it's insane. And hey, guess who's writing these regulations? Well, the banks. And they write these regulations to basically protect themselves, to build a moat so that no one, no startup can compete um, because they just can't deal with that regulatory overhead. So they've, the, the thing is, they had this for years and years. That's why like the term fintech is a very new term. It, uh, you know, the, the, really, there was no, there was no real true innovation in financial technology until Satoshi released the white paper. Of course, you had PayPal. That was kind of it, you know, mm -hmm. PayPal was kind of the only thing which was pretty revolutionary, I guess, mm -hmm. but it wasn't, it wasn't massive. And, and this really exploded a boom and, uh, in, in the, the idea of fintech afterwards, but yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a very, very difficult game to play, uh, be building a startup in this space. And, and, and there's a lot of regulatory arbitrage you have to play. Like if, if the, if there's a certain country that does something better or where you need to then move there and you, you, you're always trying to stay on your toes and all of a sudden the regulator goes, no, nah, no, I don't like it anymore. And, or a bank just goes shut down and you're like, why? And they're like, we're not obliged to tell you. And you're like, oh, okay. So okay. it's a struggle. And this is actually one of the other reasons why a lot of centralized fiat exchanges run off with people's money because um, banks, a lot of the time, this happens a lot freeze um, an entire exchange's money and um, the exchange might have a secondary bank or might not and they're like in the background keeping it all silent and you uh, and they go again hoping that not everyone will come wanting their money um, because they so they're like trying to like you know make stuff happen and and, uh, and, and they maybe open a secondary account, but that first account has frozen the money until they can prove whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Because this, and banks really made a business model out of doing this to crypto exchanges, because they could keep hold of large amounts of funds. And basically, you have to like, go, jump through a whole bunch of hoops as the as the exchange owner to release those funds. And in the meantime, they're like speculating with it all. They're doing all the fun stuff that banks do with, with credit as funds. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, yeah, a lot of time exchanges suffer from that and, um, and you don't even know they're suffering from that. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's, but it, it's getting a lot easier now that, you know, regulations have sort of made banks be a little bit more on board with that because, um, you know, there's been reports for years, for years, really strong reports that most Bitcoin activity, like most of it, a highly uh, substantial amount is, is totally legit, that the tiniest amount is dark web stuff, buying drugs. But the narrative on the news is, of course, you don't want to write about the person buying bedsheets. 
um, yeah. you know, you, you want to write about this cool story about this dark web, you know, same like I was talking the, um, in the beginning, it's sort of fascinating. I was going to say, it's the same as like the energy side of, of mining. It seems like the, oh, it's Bitcoin takes as much as a small country to, to mine. And then you realize yeah. how much energy another industry is using in another industry. We don't talk about that because it's, it's not as cool. But I, I, I'm right. just to fill one gap because you're talking about the banking system here. Even with Voltoro, what is your interaction with the banking system? Like, do you have to exchange the crypto into fiat to then buy the gold with fiat? You can't directly. There's no gold exchange, or that will take crypto as a direct payment. No, there's there's a whole lot of things that we need to move around. So we will we'll trade it um, in other exchanges or multiple exchanges. We find the best price, and and um, and yeah, there, there's there's a lot happening in the so back end for it to work. Yeah basically. And it, no, I mean, there's a bank there on us. There's multiple banks there on our side because we have to as a business, mm -hmm. but our users funds uh, aren't in a bank in because a bank. Okay. they're either in Bitcoin or they're in gold. They're gold. Right. But to get them between um, those two things, you need to go through the banking system still on some level. Exactly. Right? Okay. Yeah. Because the, the gold industry, you know, people talk about the banking industry being antiquated, but the the gold industry is next level like they're still walking around with pages on their belt and <laughs> course, you know faxing each other yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> beep 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 oh <laughs> like it, it's just weird you know they really in the when we first launched voltoro one of the uh, and we 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 uh well we when we first started talking to the ba the the gold suppliers they were like oh yeah just fax us through the order and we'll uh we'll look at it and we're like no, this faxing thing isn't going to work. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're going to have to help your tech team um, because we're looking at high frequency trades between um, a very volatile asset and a second not so volatile asset in comparison. Yeah, okay. And so, yeah, trying to deal with that and crossing that bridge was also fun. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, I can only imagine. But I mean, we're, you know, we're talking in 2021, so I realize you've been through quite the evolution over the last sort of seven years. Um, yeah. One thing I don't know in all of this is your monetization model. Like you guys, as the founders, like what was the plan at the beginning in how you would be able to well, pay all these staff and, you know, you have to have so much compliance, no doubt, uh, lawyers, accountants, everything. Um, and is it venture back too? Is, is that was the other, my other question? Yeah, yeah. So we, um, we uh, were running for a year and then we thought we better raise some money. So um, we got into Techstars, which is like a venture capitalist uh, sort of Accelerator. Uh, you know, launch pad thing. And uh, an amazing, an amazing system where you really, they take, uh, you know, people that have great ideas and teach them how to be entrepreneurs, really um, teach them how to raise money and all this. So we got into the program here in Berlin and, um, and that really opened our eyes and our, our doors. And um, from then we raised again another round. And um, the, the, the model, of course, is like any exchange, there's a spread um, between the buy and the sell. Uh, we were taking uh, on, the, on the market order, uh, on the order book, we were taking uh, fees, um, uh, trading fees. And, um, but it was a struggle as well because the people are used to paying really, really tiny spread uh, fees because in fiat exchanges, there was really, um, it was fairly simple. Like there wasn't, we have to jump through multiple things, trade it on other exchanges. We should also add fees. And, mm -hmm. and then, add, so we had to take a, a bigger chunk. So the trades were, uh, were a little bit more expensive, but for that, for the people that understood what they're getting, it was well worth it because we were still way, uh, cheaper, um, than going to a shop and buying gold. Um, because the spreads there are they're insane. Mm -hmm. So um, we were still way cheaper, but for the crypto trader that was just sort of in and out, they were like, hmm, yeah, this is, this is too much for me. And, uh, and that's why we have like a core of really uh, strong users that understand the value proposition that we're giving. And, uh, and it's, uh, yeah, really helped a lot of people. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a niche product. Mm -hmm. And this is why we wanted to... Um, now look at uh, at building out the standard which leverages uh the idea of holding physical bullion and um yeah. and go from there yeah i'd love to switch to talk about how the standard interacts here but just 
couple a couple more around Valtoro because obviously you've yeah, got sure. more years there in, in time. Um, yeah. Is it fair to say it grew, even though you said it's a small kind of niche user base, I understand why, but did it grow primarily through word of mouth because obviously crypto and gold, especially starting in 20, uh, January 2014 to 15, it would have yeah. been like on the news, anything that was new and, and well, maybe not on the news, but on the underground, on the forums, on the reddits, on the, on the yeah. discords and so on, right? So uh, is yeah. that how you grew it? Did you actually have to hire PR and do a pay-per-click campaign <laughs> and all that sort of stuff? You know, we tried all that stuff, um, of course, but um, yeah, it was primarily word of mouth. Primarily people would say, hey, you know what? Um, go, uh, Bitcoin's going to a massive bubble um, and their friends would say, you should maybe buy some gold. But I, I also would always be on different podcasts and different TV shows as on Max Kaiser's show. And, you know, because a lot of these early, early people, they, they, you know, they love what we're doing. So, uh, and I had, because I was in crypto so early, I, I knew a lot of the people that had uh, influence in terms of shows uh, and, and things. So I, you know, they would, they would invite me on and that would then drive more traffic. And it, it, yeah, definitely word of mouth and me um, being around. <laughs> and, uh, definitely at, at like events as well. Like okay. I was always uh, doing talks that uh, uh, people would always want me to talk at different events and stuff. So that, that really helped as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, let's switch to the standard then. So just obviously we've been talking for a while people may have totally forgot what you just mentioned in the standard right at the beginning of what it actually is so you want to give us another uh, overview of, of what the standard is and how did it like come about because i feel like it is connected to valtoro in, in many ways yeah 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 it is um so i i've been watching like I've obviously i watch a lot of crypto projects and one of my favorite projects at all is um is the thing that spawned DeFi, you know, decentralized finance. Um, of course, Bitcoin arguably spawned DeFi, but um, in terms of the more next generation decentralized finance, the Maker DAO protocol was really what uh, opened up the world of DeFi because you have these centralized stable coins like Tether um, and USDCs who have got apparently billions sitting in bank accounts um, and and you have to trust that they are and there's a whole bunch of risks with those you have like the fact that the banks could just decide to freeze the accounts and all of a sudden USTC couldn't get it out or tether with like what's going on or and you also it's totally intransparent you don't know are they have they got it are they liquid are they you know how many banks um, the governments could shut them down and say, hey, um, a tether was used for buying something illicit. So shut everything down. Mm. Um, do, you, do you mind, um, so, Joshua, just, just for the absolute layman, explain what tether and USTC, like what is a stable coin, just so people understand? Yeah, so uh, it, it kind of, it, tether, and, tether came, it was the first sort of fiat pegged stable uh, cryptocurrency. So what they did is it said, um, we're going to create a digital token. Um, it's like Bitcoin, but it has no real value. And we're going to say, when you come to us, uh, we'll buy it from you every time for $1. And we'll sell it to you for $1 as well. Uh, in actual fact, it's 99 cents and a dollar and one cent, and that's their business model. But it, it'll always be around that because if someone's selling that more uh, for like a dollar ten because they're, uh, you know, on something or for 90 cents, let's say, that's probably an easier, they're like desperate to get rid of that. They'll, I'll give it to you for 90 cents. Someone will buy it and bring it back to the Tether Corporation and sell it for a dollar mm -hmm. and, and, and make that money. So the arbitrage, the arbiters uh, will always go around the web trying to find where it's misaligned to the guaranteed price of one dollar and that's what pegs it now this was uh an amazing idea because what happened and such a simple idea but what happened was exactly what i was talking about before where banks would just shut down crypto exchanges uh accounts and would not allow them or they they'd go into a massive regulatory over overhead um so instead of doing that they would say no we're crypto only We've got this thing called Tether. It's not money. It's a cryptocurrency. 
Um, so where crypto, crypto is so we're unregulated and that's how they then grew and would. So it was a really great way for a crypto exchange to deal with fiat without dealing with banks and without all the regulatory overhead. And, and that's where it sort of came from. But the fact of the matter is, we, we don't know, have they got the money? And the scariest thing about Tether is that they can just print Tethers out of nowhere, which are infinite, and go and buy these rare numbers called Bitcoins or, or Ethereum or whatever, uh, these, these really special numbers, which, which there's only 21 million of these things. So, mm-hmm. and they, they must be laughing, going, huh, we, we can just create these and go and buy these rare, mm-hmm. someone's willing to, to swap this really rare thing for my like thing that I made out of nowhere. So they're not saying that, that that's what they're doing. Uh, I so just say they could. That would be illegal, right? Like if, if that got found it, out, then they Yeah, well, jail. it wouldn't, yeah, but there's also, <laughs> You know, counterfeiting money is highly illegal. So there's, it's also a very gray area, right? If I'm creating Tether and saying that it's equal to a dollar, you're not. You're saying you'll always buy one. So, so that's how they get around mm-hmm. that. But um, it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a very scary thing to have this massive. And just to let you go, uh, your listeners know, like JP Morgan Chase re- recently came out with a, with a report stating that Tether now is one of the largest investment funds or the largest funds in the world up there with BlackRock. Wow. <laughs> Just, and BlackRock, like, you know, these are like the, the, the largest in the world, like crazy large. No, and, and I just want to clarify one thing just for the beginner yeah. listener. If I buy, if I take my 1,000 US dollars of fiat and I exchange that for 1,000 to- token, tether tokens, the yep. the tether uh, exchange is keeping my one thousand US. Supposedly, they're supposed to have it available as a liquid asset to back up the tether token. But yep. the kind of allegations going around here is they've taken my thousand dollars amongst all the other money they've taken people taken from people, and they can do whatever they might want to do with it. Like you said, buy a Bitcoin or buy a, a property in China or all kinds of things mm. like that could be happening. Yeah, and then if you absolutely. get a call for that money, then there's no liquid assets to back it up. It collapses. That's right. And actually, it's, it's, it's a funny al- uh, analogy because this is kind of where fiat paper money comes from. Fiat paper money originally was a tether to gold. Mm. And uh, all these people would have this heavy, it was, you know, the people would have silver, they were, you know, kings and queens would have gold. Um, but, but the people would have silver, heavy silver. And so they would take this to their, like, let's say the Rothschilds uh, vaulting facility in Germany, and, and they would, they would give the the, the silver over and the, the vaulting facility would write a receipt. Uh, okay, you uh, one piece of silver, here you go. And here's the receipt. And eventually people would just trade the receipts rather than I've got to go to the markets, I'm going to first go to the vault, get my silver out and go then to the like, they would just say No, I was just trade my receipt and then paper money. And, uh, and the, the, the thing is that these facilities got so incredibly wealthy, so wealthy that people would walk past these estates and say, that must be you know, that, that must be a banker because no king or queen could afford this This is just far too grand. <clears throat> because they figured out that not everyone is going to come and collect their gold at the same time. So let's just write receipts um, and and charge interest for <laughs> writing a receipt out of thin air. Mm-hmm. And this is, you know, the, the start of fractional reserve banking, meaning you have a fraction of reserve on the outstanding credits that are out there. But yeah, Tether could do the same thing. They just write receipts. They just create Tether out of nowhere and say that it's Tether. But they did one thing um, out of a report, apparently, very uh, in, in the last dip after 2017, where it went right down and they bought a lot of Bitcoin fairly much at the bottom. Mm. And so the, my feeling is that they're way overcapitalized, like by far. So, but uh, my, my, my feeling is that the 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 uh, USDC, which is similar to Tether, but USDC is is a um, regulated stablecoin, 
uh, regulated by the US government. Um, they have to have everything, full checks and balances, and they have to have all that liquidity. Now, they are going to have problems as soon as the US goes into negative interest rates. Mm -hmm. Because when they go into negative interest rates, that business model breaks. You cannot pay negative, like the interest fee uh, by holding this stuff in the banks for billions of dollars. The, the, the whole business model breaks. So, so they'll have to go into a fractional reserve, mm -hmm. a legal one. They'll get a banking license and all the rest of it to do that. But you've gone, then USBC, USDC stands for circle, and you literally have gone full circle. <laughs> you've gone from, hey, let's go decentralized to like, holy moly, let's just have another <laughs> system that's fractionary reserved. And all that. <laughs> anyway, so, the, so what the MakerDAO did uh, to, to get around all of this craziness with the banking system and with, uh, you know, tethers, and you don't know if they're fully backed or not, if they're going to get shut down or if negative interest rates are going to hit. And what Tether did is say, uh, sorry, what, what MakerDAO did was say, here's a smart contract, and we're going to allow you to put Ethereum in. Um, let's say there's 10,000 euros, uh, sorry, dollars worth of Ethereum. We're going to let you borrow five, uh, like generate five thousand dollars of uh, of a stable cryptocurrency pegged to the dollar. So you've got more value. Provably, everyone can check. There's more value locked in this smart contract than there is that you've generated out there uh, in 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 this currency called Dai, D A I, and and um, and how we peg it to the dollar is we say, okay, if you do this, you borrow from yourself. So you put Ethereum in, you don't have to sell it. So let's say this is good for multiple reasons. I, I bought a car, mm -hmm. I'll be like, I don't want to sell my Ethereum. So I put it in a smart contract and I borrow enough for the car. And first of all, capital gains tax isn't there because I haven't sold. I've just got a loan. And B, it, inflation is paying off my my loan plus I haven't had to sell and it's gone up and up and up. It's not good if the crypto crashes. <laughs> but this is why you have an over collateralization because if crypto goes down, uh, the, the smart contract doesn't liquidate the assets in there. Okay. So I, I'm sorry, guys, I hope you're still with I'm, me. <laughs> I'm sure we've lost 95%. I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with this one. Maybe because for a lot of people, they don't even know what a DAO actually is. Like, obviously, that's yeah. the starting point for decentralized finance. But in a simple terms, it's just we're creating decentralized, I don't want to use the word institution, because that, that, that sounds centralized, but that's kind of what they're trying to replace. The institutions that run all aspects of finance with a decentralized version of it. Maybe you can yeah. explain it a bit more through what the standard actually is, just how that connects the dots. Yeah, so, so we, we, we took um, you know, this idea and really th th that was launched like a few years ago and we've seen a whole bunch of issues with it. Uh, we're, we're kind of the, like the next generation of this idea where you can collateralize smart contracts with, uh, with crypto assets, but also with gold. Uh, and silver and precious metals. And I'll talk about that in a minute and why. But um, the, the main thing was that, um, just to make it super simple for people, if, if a, a pawn shop, P-A-W-N, um, if you went in, <laughs> just have to spell that out. <laughs> this is basically, you take your bike in if you need money, you give it to them, they give you half the value and they get to keep the bike if you don't come back in a week and buy it back uh, for, for a little bit more than they lent it to you with interest. Or, uh, or you go back and, and you, you, you buy it back and you have your bike. So, but uh, this system is rather than trusting a shop to do that in a centralized mechanism, it's a decentralized mechanism where it's just a, sm it's just a bunch of code where you send money in and it generates things and you have the private keys you're the only one that has keys and it's code and it's hard coded no one can change it there's no dodgy man standing there you know it's going to rip you off it's just it's you know two plus two is always equal to four so you know the code you know what it'll do and it won't change so this is this is what it does and and uh so the standard is all about allowing people that have got gold there's five trillion dollars worth of personal wealth sitting 
in voting facilities around the world. So we want to allow them to take that, um, tokenize it into a smart contract. If they're holding maybe a few thousand in gold, they don't want to sell the gold, but they, uh, you know, the washing machine broke, they want some liquidity. They can put that into a smart contract, borrow against themselves um, in, in a stable cryptocurrency that's in their local currency. So we're starting with euros. Um, so it'll be standard euro. And then we'll be branching out to standard dollar, standard yen, standard ruble, standard shekel, standard, you know, okay. Australian dollar. And Let me ask else. you this then as an example. I have a million dollars in gold bullion locked up in a Swiss safe. I want to buy a yep. property in Berlin. I come to, in theory, I know you guys are sort of still starting it up, but it's up and running. I want, yep. so I bring it in, I create, uh, I, I collateralize my gold. So I somehow am bringing it to the Dow. That is the standard, right? It's then yep. turning, uh, is it the full million dollars worth of bullion or is it 80% or 90% gets turned into a Euro stable coin? And then I could take the Euro stable coin. I assume I could exchange it on exchange for actual Euro fiat if, yeah. if the house seller would not take my Euro stable coin, it would take my Euro dollars. Yeah and buy the property. Yep. But then what happens? Like, do I have to pay interest to keep that loan going? Is there a time stamp where I have to pay it back? How does it all play out? Exactly. There's an interest rate. And this is what really pegs it to the euro. So there's a whole bunch of people that have borrowed S euro, let's call them standard euro. And, um, and what gives that value? What pegs that value to the euro? Well, it's this interest rate. And well, we call it a stability fee, just like maker does. But it's what happens is that if the value drops of S euro to the euro, let's say it's 90 cents to the actual euro, uh, what the DAO will do, this, this, the DAO is like a, the whole community that govern the system. Uh, they'll say, okay, lift interest rates a little bit on everybody. So everyone that's got loans out there will go, oh, that's too much for me. I don't, you know, the, not everyone, but some people will say, I, I don't want to pay that much interest. So they'll go into secondary markets, start buying back S euro. And that demand does what? It the price. lifts the price back to a euro. Now, if, if it overshoots to maybe a, a euro 10 cents, then the system might say, okay, drop, <laughs> uh, drop the, the stability fee or the interest rate. And, and people go, oh, wow, look how cheap it is to borrow money from, uh, from, from the standard. And they will then collateralize smart contracts and borrow from themselves, pump that into the market. And that will, of course, cause too much supply, which might drop it back down. And, and this is why it's called a soft peg, because it doesn't purely sit on one to one. It, it kind of dances around and is and is, uh, you know, the, the lever of interest rates, just like central banks mm -hmm. do. But instead of a few we, old men in closed doors deciding to like lift the interest rates, um, they, it, it's like thousands of people all around the world in a, in a, in a transparent manner saying, okay, um, we, let's, let's, uh, let's lift or lower the interest rates for the, that's good. That's a good example. I understand. So my million, uh, gold, which is then turned into the Euro stable coin, I have a, a fluctuating interest rate. So it might be at, at 2%, which I'm, I have to pay off. I assume using whatever means I have to make money. So it might be my job or yeah. other assets. So I'm, I'm actually putting back in euros into, is it your DAO I'm putting it back into? Or am I just buying, like, how is that facilitated? You send it back to the smart contract that, you, that you've that you got collateral in, that you okay. borrowed from. So it's not us, we don't have anything to do with, we're just coding this thing. So um, the contract is, is just like a, an address and it'll say, and you go to a website and anyone can build an interface that will interact with this decentralized application. Um, but we'll build the very first interface. Um, so you'll go to the standard.io and, um, and it'll see, you'll see on there, okay, you've got this much uh, collateral and you've borrowed this much. Um, and slowly, what you don't have any time limit. The interest that you're occurring is basically just moving your collateralization to the, down, to the cutoff right. time. Right. So you always have to be over collateralized. The whole system has to have more value locked up than there is floating around. This is very different than the current system where we have zero collateral locked up anywhere uh, and governments can just print more. Uh, and so, so this is the, the fundamental difference uh, that we're doing here that you can provably know that there's more collateral locked up. So, so 
uh, over time, and what happens if it does cross that collateralization, there's a whole pe bunch of people that have um, uh, put uh, S euro into uh, into the the smart into a smart contract that's ready to buy up liquidated assets, and they buy them 15% under spot. Mm. So, so they get like a really good deal for closing Gold someone's right. Yeah, okay. yeah, gold and crypto. So and crypto. there's uh, these contracts are collateralized with crypto like ETH, uh, as well as Boolean okay. from participating uh, vaulting facilities that have plugged themselves into the standard. Right. So you for example, your Vault Toro would be, if I'm holding a million dollars with a gold in Vault Toro, I could then say, listen, yeah. I need to get out half a million of that for another, for an asset yeah. purchase. I then go to the standard, I, I connect my Vault Toro account, it pulls yeah. in half of my Vault, Vault Gold into the standard yeah. DAO, it then shows up as collateral and as drawable um, asset under the European yep. stablecoin in this case, pull Spot out the money, on. I go buy my my house or whatever, and then it, it yep. shows me that I have to keep making this minimum. Well, once it starts reaching the point, if I get if I'm worried, I got to keep paying down that interest or paying down the the principal there, right? And I, I'm yep. assuming that will be connected. Like it looks like a almost like a wallet with with like a interface on yep. the internet, and I would just possibly need to move fiat into an exchange, turn it into the stable coin for the Euro, move it, the stable coin into the standard protocol DAO, and then I could and put it against exactly. the interest. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. And you Got pay it. yourself back. And the, the great thing is like over time, the inflation pays off your loan. You know, if you've got uh, a loan for 10 years and you bought, you know, with half a million, you bought a house. Uh, and then in 10 years time, that same half a million buys a carton of milk, then you kind of paid off your house with a carton of milk mm -hmm. sort of value, you know, so uh, this is this is the thing that they, and a lot of people don't realize this, this is a really financial education 101 is how do the wealthy keep their wealth during inflationary periods. And every single time it's because what you do is you go short the the thing that's losing value, meaning you borrow the thing that's losing value, sell it and and buy back. So so for the listeners that don't know what shorting is, is when you um, everyone knows on the stock market, oh, I'll buy some Tesla stock because I think it's going to go up and everyone I can comprehend that you can think, OK, yeah, I get that. That's that's how you make money in the stock market. But how you you also have a very important mechanism in the stock exchange called called going short. And that's betting on the price going down. And how that works is, is uh, let's say um, uh, someone has Tesla stock and I believe Tesla is going to go down in price. What I would do is borrow that Tesla stock off that person with interest. So he'd lend it to me with interest and then I'd sell it straight away. It would go down in price. I'd buy it back, pay them back and keep the difference. Yeah. And this is the idea of shorting. So. The same thing when, uh, when let's say you're living in Venezuela um, four five years ago, what you would do is you would effectively borrow a whole bunch of Venezuelan Boulevard and 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 and, and buy physical real assets with it, and um, and then ten years later buy back the Boulevard, which is like now worth nothing. Mm -hmm. Pay the person that you borrowed it from back and with interest, of course, and uh, and deal with that. So let Sorry. me just to, to, to maybe a less extreme example in Venezuela. Um, <laughs> let's say I, and this is very realistic. I've got Bitcoin at fifty thousand a coin. Again, I've got a five hundred thousand worth of Bitcoin, so I've got ten coins. I bring it into the standard protocol. I want to use the, the collateral to buy a property. I buy a property worth say four hundred thousand U.S. dollars, so I've still got a hundred thousand kind of buffer in, in the collateral there, which I can use yeah. to keep paying back the interest and keep me safe, whatever the case may be. Yep. But while I'm doing this, the actual price of Bitcoin doubles to a hundred thousand. How does that impact yep. the situation I'm in? It, basically, you can go back onto the site and borrow more against that because at the end of the day, it's calculated in the current in real in the currency that it's pegging. So yeah, in real time. So 
Now, um, you know, if it's the standard euro that you've borrowed, um, then it would be equivalent to the euro price of your collateral. So my $100,000 uh, would be $200,000, like the leftover there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the money exactly. I pulled out, because it's all been pulled out, but the money I've left is fluctuating mm -hmm. with the whatever the current rate yep. is. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Got it. All right. So it's kind of a yeah, way to liquidize very illiquid assets, still benefit from price increases. Um, and like you said, you could hedge against ups and downs, if, uh, you know, short and depending uh, on what, where you like, obviously you'd want to not spend it all. Like that's also the risk here is you collateralize a hundred percent of it. Yeah. And then, you know, you're not, you're, you're, you're basically locked in because you spent it at that rate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You don't want to be liquidated. Like there's, there's that penalty fee of 15%. The reason for that is because you want, uh, you want a market for people ready to buy those liquidated assets. Because when, when it gets liquidated, what you want to do is you want to take the euros off of the market because you get to keep the euro, the S euro stable coin that you've borrowed. Um, let's say you've disappeared. Uh, but the system always wants more collateral than S euro floating around. So these people that buy these assets are basically taking standard euro off the market buying the asset back. And when that happens, they get burnt. Uh, those SUOs get burnt and uh, or destroyed and um, and the, the people get the underlying asset. Right, um, right. Okay, uh, maybe last few questions. I know we've been here for a long time, Joshua. I appreciate the time. Um, we've dived oh, deep into your history and, and, and also, I mean, my last few questions are all around the standard protocol. So let's first, I know we haven't mentioned it yet, but we'll put it in the show notes and we'll mention it again, but it's the standard.io if you want to check the current progress of this. And just so we know for other people listening earlier to Vault Toro, so Vault or Vol, T-O-R-O, Vault, O-R-O dot com, Vault Toro. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just a few questions around the standard because this is so new. Like all of this DeFi is new. It's trying to replace very trusted institutions in our society. So a big part of this is just a lack of or trust. untrusted, whichever. Well, yeah, both, right? Like we yeah. trust them and like mainstream society will always trust the bank until they don't, right? Yeah. But um, I am curious, even just thinking of the examples we were giving with the house or, or whatever, and there's so many layers, like, you know, the, the, the pricing of the crypto, the stability of the crypto, if you're using something yeah. like Tether, what they're doing with, you know, the stable coin, um, it's, it's, uh, do I trust the DAO that you're talking about with, with your standard protocol, the, yeah. the interface, there's so many different, I feel like, I don't want to call them breakable, but parts yeah. I don't yet trust enough, even oh, though they it's technology. Are absolutely breakable. Yeah. The, this code is, is, yeah, we, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, this is one of the things why I think we've had such success raising, uh, the initial first round in this project is because we've had since 2015, um, never never had a hack we're obsessed with security and we do things slowly but properly and um and this is uh, i think i think what people appreciated yeah but yeah sorry to interrupt you there. well no, my questions are like how comfortable should i be moving like uh, if it's i have a million dollars net worth and i do want to it's it's i want to keep it safe but i also want to be smart with it and 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 leverage it in the best ways i can and i just don't know whether i trust anything in DAO yet. I'm having, I can barely yeah. trust Bitcoin because I can buy it on Coinbase or, you know, some yeah. kind of reasonably now it's floated on the stock market. It seems like a, have a regulated safe. It's not Mount Gox basically. Um, <laughs> you know, I've reached that point where we're Robin Hood traders, so on. Um, but we're yeah. not like, there's no DAO I know of that mainstream society feels like, you know, they don't have the app on their phone and they're using it to for example, I could imagine it'd be amazing. The standard apps on my phone, I just go, I need some cash. I pull it out of my collateral and away you go, right? Yeah. I could, I could yeah. run my entire life on just that one account potentially. And it's going yeah. all against my, I'm keeping it in Bitcoins. So I'm not, I'm getting the benefits mm. of that. that. So mm. where, how do we get to the point? Like, I guess that's my question here. Given all these things that we don't trust and we don't yeah. know yet, how do we get to the point where this swaps out the pawn store, the bank, and that's P-A-W-N again, um, <laughs> and, and the banks and the traditional lending and all the systems that we have in place now for, you know, hundreds of years, yeah. if not thousands of years for fiat currency. So how do we get to that point? What, what, what are the steps? 
You know, one of the, there's so many scams in this space. So you have to trust that the code is right, that it's not a scam, that it's, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a whole lot of bunch and, and people like yourself that have got great podcasts that are, that educate the mainstream is one big pillar in this story. But the second thing is really ha having a solid grandma friendly user interface and, um, that, that, that it's all about user interface because when Bitcoin first started, it's this ugly interface that was absolutely written by Satoshi himself <laughs> and it's just awful, right? <laughs> it was made by technicians for technicians, but as you move further down the line, like when when the internet first arrived on the scene, to write an email, you had to do it with command line. And you would have said, well, how's anyone ever going to use this? And now you've got grandpa sitting in his nursing home on his iPad swiping all day long. And and this is really what it comes down to is that things like the iPad focused on user experience and on intuitiveness and um, having no uh, uh, no real uh, manual for it. it. It's so intuitive that you don't need a user manual. And, mm -hmm. and this is what it comes down to. But it, without a user manual, you kind of need that, that education. And this is one of the beautiful thing I love about crypto is that it's brought the conversation back to what is money around the dinner table. This is a conversation that when they were going off the gold standard, people actually had around the dinner table It'd be like, well, what do you think? Uh, should we or shouldn't we go off there? And people say yes, but there would be this big debate. And for the last, you know, 40, 50, 60 years, like we just don't talk about that stuff. Uh, it's just, you know, it's just not really mentioned. So, so it, it's had this renaissance of education, just within the family. Um, and because people are making so much money in crypto, it's like, I have to learn about this. So naturally, a lot of people are going out there learning what is this? What is that? What is DeFi? What is and, and so that coupled with good interface coupled with great, um, uh, you know, education and uh, resources like yourself um, will allow that to happen. But yeah, I mean, this is the, the main focus for us is to um, to, to build what we have to do is build an amazing user experience, um, also partner with other systems. So we're already talking to, um, to ATM operators, um, to allow the, the interface on an ATM to like draw out because, uh, you know, I think I saw, what was it? It was like 73%. I'm not quite sure of the number. It was something like that. 73 or 78% of all Americans, and I'm pretty sure it's something similar in Europe, are living paycheck to paycheck. And this sort of this cycle is extremely hard to break because they just don't get a chance to save. So I feel like these sorts of technologies that that we're building, but other people are too, allow people to save, but borrow from themselves to have liquidity to pay for life. Mm -hmm. So you can do a bit of both. Of course, it's, you know, you do need a little bit of extra, but, but building mechanisms for people to save on a regular basis with their paycheck and then borrow instantly liquidity from themselves. Uh, so they have, they can live, but still save. This breaks these sort of cycles. And so I, I think there's certain things about DeFi that is allowing people to want to learn about it, which is really, really interesting. Um, it's one of those, it's one of those uh, uh, great things about cryptocurrency that people really want to learn. I, mm. And it's also having a knock on effect with with banks like the, uh, the Coinbase, for instance, wanted dared to want to offer 4% interest on their on their on people holding stable, uh, like holding fiat. Mm -hmm. And the SEC was like, no, you can't do that. That must be a scam. But really what they're doing in the back end is using all the DeFi um, systems. And in fact, for the folks that don't know, the decentralized finance 
space now does more volume per day than the entire fintech sector put together. And that includes these, these unicorns like, uh, like Venmo. So, so the amount of volume is, is extraordinary. So if, if Coinbase was to do that, and, and how it's doing that, because SEC was like, well, how are you doing that? It must be a scam. Well, no, you're, what you're doing is in traditional banks, you put your money in the banks and about 15 people and layers all take a cut mm -hmm. until they give it to some clever market maker who basically buys and sells on with your liquidity. And DeFi, you cut out all those people and just stick the money into an automated market maker yourself. <laughs> and and you gain those profits straight away. So you can you can gain like quite a lot of money right. just by allowing liquidity. So this is what Coinbase is doing. And, and the SEC knows that if Coinbase does this, that it will be a black hole, people will move their money out of every single bank and say, why would I store it with you? Um, you know, Deutsche Bank, if I can just bring it across to Coinbase mm -hmm. and earn 4% APY, mm -hmm. like, it's a no brainer. It's a no brainer, especially when Coinbase gets a banking license or whatever else. You know, Kraken has just got a banking license. Well, I was, so, I was actually going to ask you, how do we, because this sounds like the final hurdle here and the biggest one, that exact point you just made. The banking system, the government, if we destabilized our traditional way, I say we, but I don't know who we is, but, you know, if, <laughs> if people start moving their money, out of that and into even something as simple as Coinbase, because they understand that they're really comfortable with it. 4% interest sounds great. It removes, it causes the biggest problem for the banks. It takes away their liquidity. And that feels yeah. like everything collapses in terms of the traditional sense when that happens. So obviously the government steps in and says, no, how do we get past this government hurdle? Is it, is, is it possible? We have to go through chaos to get to a solution. Look, the, the thing is that the government can't stop this. It's just a matter of time. Like, if Coinbase isn't going to offer, do you think that the SEC can really stop someone going and buying Tether, collateralizing some contract over Curve where they yield farming 3%, putting that over into an NFT, collateralizing something? Like, the space is so crazy, it's unregulatable. Mm -hmm. It really is. And so we just have to come to peace with the fact that first, the legacy system is breaking apart anyway. It's a complete, fundamentally corrupt system. And I'm not saying corrupt as in there's a corrupt person. It's just a corrupt system, meaning you can't have more credit than there is interest. It's like a huge game of musical chairs with way too little chairs. And there's a lot of people that have to sit down when that music stops and it's not gonna be enough space for all of them. So mm -hmm. so this, this system, is already showing the cracks. So they're blaming COVID, but it has nothing to do with it. It was already cracking massively. And, and, and to protect the value of the dollar, once you get into crypto, you start, to see, you start to see why the US was constantly in wars, constantly trying to protect the use cases of the US dollar. Um, because the more, you know, every time Bitcoin gets another use case, like, yeah, PayPal now accepts Bitcoin. It's like this big uh, yeehaw. Why? Because we as a community realize the more use cases you have, especially large use cases, the more value it has. So if the US loses the oil settlement layer of the US dollar, it's a huge use case that gets destroyed, further lowering the need to buy dollars on the markets. And so, uh, so, so the whole system is slowly uh, falling apart for, mul for multiple reasons. And this system just happens to be there for people to jump into. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so whether you are a tech technocrat and you just love the technology, you're going to get into crypto. If that's not the reason, then, uh, hey, um, you're some sort of like libertarian. If that's not the reason, you're like just an investor and you're seeing the massive profits. If that's not the reason, then you're an artist and you're just loving this weird NFT thing that's going on. And you can like what I can actually keep track of what I'm selling. And, and if that's not the reason you need to get money to India and don't have a bank account, like whatever reason you have, you're going to fall into the system that is building around. And thankfully, 
and hopefully it stays decentralized. And this is why Bitcoin really, really, really fought for having smaller blocks. Um, and that's, that's a whole big thing here. No, we won't go into it because not enough time. I mean, they fought about it for, for years and years. But the, the fundamental thing is you really need to stay decentralized. Really, really, really important. Because it's super easy to, like Binance Smart Chain, for instance, it's just a clone of Ethereum. It's amazing because it's way cheaper. Amazing. But actually, it's super centralized. So what you've done is you've sacrificed decentralization for efficiency and speed. Mm. But what have we got then? We've got a system that can be controlled if need be. Yeah. And there's a whole lot of stuff at risk from the legacy system who've still got a lot of firing power to try and control this thing. And, and if we remember Napster in the music industry, right. there's a lot of hipping and throwing and suing and yeah. trying to stop things happening, well, coming was, our way. I was actually going to point out China and, and wonder about your input there, because obviously they have the, you know, the, 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 the levers within their society where they can say, we're going to make you disappear if you stop doing this. So it's, I feel like they can take it in a very analog way. They can make the server farm go away that runs. Yeah. And, and I know decentralization, obviously, by its nature, means it's it's spread around across the planet. All these different servers maintain it or individual computers. But, you know, I guess what I'm saying is, is there, I feel like I'm going to answer my own question here. I feel like because it is so distributed, no one government can shut down the entire system. Yes, they could stop their citizens, perhaps interfacing with it, with the threat of their life, basically. Um, yeah. But at the end of the day, the system will always be there because somewhere in the world, these computers are up and running. So as long as we have electricity and we have silicon and computers, then these protocols and these platforms and the blockchain continues to exist and, and uh, it'll just be used. Absolutely, spot on. I mean, it, <laughs> The, 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 the profit driver, profit driver is such an innately and, and, and powerful driver that we've seen proof of work that's behind the Bitcoin consensus mechanism, uh, like you said, take up more energy than, than some countries put together. That, that, that just by, by adding some profit into participating. Now, what we're seeing in China right now is yeah they've banned proof of proof of work's fairly simple to ban because hey <laughs> it's pretty easy to see the mega kilowatts just getting sucked into one area or um, that you know ban it and but what's happening is we're seeing like proof of stake which is just a wallet it's just got data coming in and out if it's encrypted it's just a bunch of data they they can't discern it if you're technical enough you can have a proof of stake wallet that is basically taking part in securing a network and um, and the Chinese citizen that knows what they're doing doesn't even have to have it in China. They can just log into it somewhere yeah. else and have it run from there. And so there's, it, it's a very difficult thing to stop. You can stop physical hardware, but networks, software networks are extremely agile and um, and and hard to shoot bullets at. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, it's it's really like shooting bullets at a swar swarm of bees. It mm -hmm. just is dumb. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and and you're spot on. Like you can threaten someone with force, uh, but there's a saying in you know that my Chinese friends would say, and that's the land is vast and the emperor is far away. And that's kind of the mentality a lot of Chinese people have. Is like yeah, it's illegal, and you'll read it, but but you know. Uh, there's a whole district actually that just does it and you know, it's like okay. like m exporting money out of china there's all these like controls but there's whole districts in china that deal with just that problem so it's, mm. let's see let's see okay joshua uh we've almost two hours here so i do again really appreciate your time and, and um such a great doorway i think into many topics for the listener whether it's DeFi, even just proof of stake versus proof of work like you just talked about we're not going to go into that right now you can research <laughs> that yourselves listeners um i just wanted to wrap up just with your own evolution here you said you raised funding for the standard protocol so where are you at with this project um, yeah, so we did a little pre-sale just to allow us to hire more developers and do some R&D and some really technical stuff because Ethereum is very expensive at the moment. So we're going to natively do it on a layer two for those that know what that means. 
it basically means that we can uh, do it at, at, at micro cents, like less than a cent transactions rather than uh, for. But um, and nevertheless, uh, it's, it's gotten us to a point where we can do this. Uh, the next thing we'll have is a, 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 pre, a private sale um, with, and, and actually it's, it's private because it's just anyone that signs up with us, um, signs up to the newsletter and, uh, and joins the community and interacts with us and, you know, builds this thing because we're, um, we're, we're still a small project. We're still pretty, pretty uh, you know, under the radar. And, um, and so it's people coming in to our Telegram, chatting with us, figuring out, uh, you know, giving us feedback. Um, and, uh, and, and for those, then, will be a private sale available, and, uh, and that will help us raise enough money to build the MVP and, and uh, you know, really have liquidity enough to put liquidity into, into markets and, and allow us to kickstart this, uh, this amazing project. So, um, you know, we really see the standard as fundamental groundwork infrastructure for uh, decentralized 2.0, DeFi 2.0, and and so um, so that's that's what that's where we're at right now. So I'd definitely recommend people jump on to the standard.io um, and um, and check it out, read about it, and join the Telegram and uh, ask ask us anything. Okay, yeah, cool. <laughs> and just to clarify, when you say you're going to be doing a private raise you're selling the tst token eventually and you use yeah. the collateral from that to hire engineers to keep building and, and move on but the original yep. raise you've done so far was that also selling tst or are you actually getting exactly okay so you've not there's no traditional yeah, yeah. vc angel anything normal funding here this is all within no the that's right we, we had we have um some angel investors and we had some vcs but we really don't want huge whales, and we have a, a few VCs that have bought, but their tokens are vesting over time. Since your your show is all about vesting, <laughs> uh, it's it's, uh, it's important that um, uh, one of the big pr big traps that a lot of people are falling into uh, in this whole space is they're buying into tokens that uh, you know this, the the community have called it uh, rug pools. Uh, where basically large players will fund the very early parts of the project. They'll see a doubling in the pr in the price of the token, and the team is excellent. They're building, they're kicking goals, they're moving forward. Yet the the initial investors then dump all their coins onto a market, get out at the, at two x, and mm -hmm. it basically destroys the project because even though they're doing everything technically right, the price is dumped and. And um, and they find it really really hard to get that back up because people lose confidence. So yeah, okay. uh, we've tried everything we can to like large large players need to be vesting over a twenty four month period to forty eight month period and depending on how large their stake is. But mm -hmm. yeah, TST um, is kind of the governance token of the whole system. So we talked a little bit about DAOs. We touched on it. It's a decentralized autonomous organization and and it's kind of like companies two point for the listeners. It's it's a way that People all around the world can um, can govern uh, the rule set of a, of a system and be rewarded. And, and these TST tokens are kind of uh, keys to that door. Um, and they, you know, these these players, uh, they they these people set the the interest rates, or they and they get rewarded for all these sort of things. But there's a whole part that we didn't touch on, like prediction markets that we're looking at using as a governance model. Um, because voting on things is, is kind of a, uh, you know, it's a, I find it a, a silly way of making decisions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everyone has their, everyone thinks voting is fantastic, and mm -hmm. if we didn't have it, we'd have dictatorships. But uh, I think there's other mechanisms we can use rather than voting. And so uh, maybe that's for another show, but, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> but prediction markets are a very interesting uh, uh, side of this whole uh, thing that we're building. So, um, uh, yeah, th th that's... So that's uh, where we're at. Last question, Joshua. Um, what exactly is your day job right now? What are you doing? Like, are you you CEO of, of basically, like you seem to be doing now, going out on podcasts and talking about the standard and helping to spread the word? And but you you must do yeah. something during the day as well that to get this DAO up. Oh right. yeah, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm definitely uh, working a lot. I mean, so I stepped down as CEO from Voltoro and my half brother who built my co-founder. Uh, uh, took over as CEO. Um, we were always sort of co-CEOs anyway. Uh, he was just more in the background. 
Um, but uh, he's full-time CEO on that, and I've really stepped down to become um, chief innovation officer, uh, we've called it, <laughs> at Voltoro. And, uh, and this is why we focus on the standard to bring really another use case to gold rather than it just sitting there. We can allow people to do all this good stuff. And, and, uh, and, and so on a day job, yeah, um, basically organizing, uh, doing, um, you know, building the team, finding great uh, developers and cryptographers to join, um, reaching out to all my network around the world um, uh, that, that have been in crypto and know what they're doing to join us. Um, and um, so, yeah, everything from biz, biz dev to dealing with all the normal HR stuff of running a business. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and now with a decentralized one, it's a really fun, interesting thing because you're dealing with people all around the world and, and communicating over, uh, you know, uh, Telegram and Discords and Slacks and things like that. So um, that that's what I do day to day is uh, try to organize the team and um, and yeah. Okay. Market. Um, and, and timeline, what do you, when do you think this will be, like I will actually put a download some kind of app and collateralize my crypto? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't like to give timelines because it's, it's something that's really hard to build and we don't want to release something if it's unsecure. You know, we really want to uh, make sure that it's secure. But if I had to say a vague thing, uh, we're looking at about... Um, about six months for the MVP. Okay. Um, yeah, I, there's a lot of R&D that we're doing already and that have already been done. Um, we've already started coding. Um, it's, I think we'll get it done earlier, but that's kind of a, a sort of a goal that we're heading towards. Um, and uh, I mean, we've seen projects like Cardano, it's been what, four years, four and a half years, I still don't have a product running. So that's a, like, yeah. um, it, it's a hard thing that, that they're building, that we're building. It's, uh, they're, they're, they're trying to do it properly. We're trying to do it properly. So it's, um, it's just one of these things. Fair enough. Okay. Joshua Shigala, thank you for almost two hours. Um, what a journey from being born <laughs> stateless to growing up in Australia as a this sort of designer to then a couple of startups with, in fashion, which sort of leads you to the cypherpunk movement to then crypto to being early in Bitcoin to losing what you had in the Mt. Gox to then starting Vault Toro and getting involved in gold and, and Bitcoin exchange to then now the standard. It's, that's awesome. What a, and still in the early days. Making money stateless. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All the way to making well, money stateless. That's obviously <laughs> massive. So um, <laughs> any other websites besides the standard.io and vaulttoro.com you want to share with us or? Oh, I mean, you can follow me on Twitter at uh, J Shigala. That's J S C I G A L A. Um, I saw rant about all sorts of stuff on there, and uh, whether you, uh, you know, you can engage with me, whether you, uh, you know, agree with me or awesome. not. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate the time. Hey, I really, really appreciate your time as well. It's been a fantastic interview. One of the best. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs>